Hello, everyone. My name is David Ahern. I work for a company called Infabrica, and I'm going to talk about some uh, recent networking experiments that we've done to check out how Linux is scaling. So we started out with this fundamental question. How does the network stack scale as line rate increases? Specifically, we're not focused on the current 100G and 200G that exist today, where you, you can see that you can't get 200G line rate for a single flow. We're focused on the next generations, the 400G, the 800G. What does it take to run applications at that scale? And by scale, we're not talking about just scaling out, but scaling up. We want to be able to push a single flow to line rate, things like the machine learning apps, just as much as we want to be able to leverage that line rate across multiple flows on the server, right? So one reason we want to start this now is we have to get out in front on what's needed. If there's anything that's needed to the Linux kernel, as we all know, changes to Linux can take a very long time. In some cases, XDB hints being the poster child right now, it can take in way too long to get very needed performance improvements into the kernel. So let's start now, get in before the hardware is available. So to that end, we created a custom setup to investigate how to push Linux software at higher and higher rates. And when I wrote the abstract back in June, I was able to hit 670 gigabits for a single flow, 31 million, there's 31.8 million packets per second, again, for a single flow. Somewhere around end of June, early July, we had hardware failure, fans went out, had to get the motherboard replaced. The person that takes care of the hardware for us, he made some other changes. And when that box got reinstalled a few weeks ago, I was kind of surprised to see a new limit, 782 gig. So the setup is now coming close to what is two generations out for line scale rates. So how did we get there? So we took two off the shelf servers. These are, just custom, these, are, these are just standard commodity servers running Ryzen 9 Zen 3 CPUs, 5 gigahertz this is CPU rate, 3200 memory speed, stock OS. We took the 5.11 kernel was our starting point. Then we moved to 5.13 a few months later for some other reasons. The key here is that this is an unmodified kernel. All of our changes are in our code. We didn't make any changes to the Linux code. We're using VCU 1525 FPGAs from Xilinx to have our custom logic to do these tests. Now these cards are PCI Gen 3 by 16 based. 128 is our cap from the PCI perspective. We have two 100 gig interfaces. So how do we push higher than 200 G to, to, to do these studies if our physical limits are bounded? When you look at some of the, these benchmarking apps, they don't really, the, the payload on these apps is kind of irrelevant. And if it's irrelevant, why send it, right? So let's save that precious bandwidth going over the wire for the things that we care about and this ability to stress the Linux software stack to see where it's breaking and what's needed to make it go faster, okay? So what we've done is you got an application running on host A. It does the normal socket setup, the normal receive message, send message kind of calls. It's pushing a message down to the kernel. The TCP, pack, TCP stack does its thing, creates some SKBs, and those get pushed down to the driver. The driver looks at SKB, copies the headers into the descriptor, looks at the payload and says, ah, this thing's supposed to have, say, n bytes on it, say 1448 bytes. Puts that amount into the descriptor, drops the payload. The user logic in the FPGA sees that data link and says, oh, this packet's supposed to have a certain amount of bytes onto it. And if it's a TSO packet, it does the right thing in splitting it up and then puts the actual proper payload for that MTU size into the header. So we're stashing the true data link of that packet in the urgent pointer just to make a valid packet that can be routable through a network and getting over to the peer. On the peer side, the user logic in the FPGA sees that urgent pointer is set and says, oh, this packet is supposed to have payload on it. Let me tell software about this. So it sets the descriptor, the, the, the data link in the descriptor to the value that's supposed to be on that payload. 
The driver that's managing this, this FPGA keeps a data queue, right? So it's gonna manage a data queue just like every other high-speed NIC out there, right? So when a packet comes in, the hardware's gotta land the payload somewhere. Well, in this case, the driver is managing a data queue just like it normally would. And instead of the hardware landing the data, the driver looks at that, that descriptor and says, I have to come up with X amount of bytes of payload data. Pops the first entry off the data queue, signs that to the SKB frag as a pretend data to go up the stack, okay? If it's a larger packet, we just keep popping pages off the, the data queue until we've given the SKB the amount of data that is supposed to be on that packet when it goes up to the stack, okay? The key here, no modifications to the kernel, all the games to avoid these PCI limits and the physical limits of our network, it's all contained in the bottom end of the driver and the FPGA user logic. Anyone who's run any kind of test now, first thing you need to hit is no copy. So get the easy one out of the way, right? I think it's fairly easy to say modern workloads need hardware to land data and application buffers. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Linux has zero copy APIs. The TX one is fairly easy to use, but it's got some overhead around pinning pages and weeping completions. The RX is zero copy API. It's really constrained. It's not a generic algorithm. Um, it requires a specific MTU. A, the, the data has to come in in page size chunks so that it can do the page flipping. And then there's a sideband with mem copy for anything less than pay, the, the memory copy, right? So what I did was I modified iperf 3 to implement the TC zero copy API. That's good enough for these tests to show the intent, which is avoiding the memory copy for every packet that's coming in going from kernel to user space. The extra cycles around the page pinning and completions, it's a factor. It shows up in the perf reports, but it's not a limiting one. It allows us to do these tests. The ZC API for Rx is not usable for this case. So we mimic the intent of it by just dropping the data. So again, using the standard BSD socket API calls, we're setting up the socket, we do a receive message, but we call it with message trunk. The idea here is that the kernel will tell the application how much data it was going to give it and then drops it. So we avoid the mem copies and we get to do this, you know, if, if the data was landing in the buffers, everything's working like it was supposed to be and the application's being told what was landed. So the end result here is that we're avoiding the mem copy, but we're still using all the existing APIs. And this allows us to, to go forward with some of these experiments. Second thing you're going to hit is memory management. I said I was hitting 31 million, 31.8 million packets per second. That's 31.8 million pages per second that the driver has to keep track of to land those packets, to, to land things that are coming in for that application. Okay, that's a lot of data. First thing you learn is that that old school DevOps pages is never going to work. Right? Modern NIC drivers are using the page pool infrastructure. Even more, they have to use their own per CPU page cache on top of page pool to really get the, the, the um, overhead of managing pages down. Okay. The NLX5 driver is an example of this. If I recall correctly, I think the page pool infrastructure now has the per CPU cache um, going on top of the page pool. The key is that you absolutely cannot go out to any kind of a global allocator. You gotta be able to manage things locally, okay? And then the other thing is an SKB. You gotta have an SKB for the network of the stack, okay? Well, the NAPI cache served a good purpose here. That was a very good optimization I got and put in. It allows, again, local recycling of these SKBs to avoid some more overhead. The key point I wanna make about memory management, the current, the current buffer management scheme has way too much overhead to be thinking about 400, 800 G kind of line rates. The next thing you gotta do is amortize that software overhead, okay? You've gotta do things like validate the packets coming in. Is it being forwarded? Is it going to, to deliver locally? Um, is there an application waiting for this packet, right? So you gotta do a socket lookup. There's all these different generic OS infrastructures that have gone in for TC, for NetFilter, for eBPF, all these nice hooks that people use. This is also overhead that every one of these packets trips over, okay? 
So how do you reduce that so that the software packet rate that's being uh, gone through? Well, there's two levers for this. Normally, if you ask someone, how do you get increased throughput, they'll say, increase the MTU. But that's kind of a naive response. You, you can't just jack the MTU to 9100 or over your number, okay? You really gotta have uh, a more um, sensible approach into how you're, you're managing things. The other lever is to do TSO and GR. And the idea there is that you're pushing your effective MTU. So in other words, the MTU that the software receives you're pushing that as close to 64 kilobytes as possible. To give a, a pictorial view of what's happening here, you have an application that's sending a buffer and it goes down in the network stack. And the TCP stack wants to use TSO, for example. And so what it's trying to do is to create an SKB with a payload as close to 64 kilobytes minus 256 as it can, 256 being for packet headers. But it has some constraints. It wants to create in MTU sized packets on the wire, or it wants the hardware to be able to do that. So what it's really doing is setting its TSO goal size to be n times the max segment size so that you're creating these MTU sized packets, okay? Now, this packet goes down the stack, goes to the driver, driver sets it up for the hardware, and the hardware sits there and slices that packet into n MTU sized packets. Those packets hit the wire, they go over to the peer. Hopefully, conceptually, they all arrive in the same coalescing window so that the driver is processing those packets all within the same time window. It allocates an SKB, attaches that page frag to represent the data, sends it up to software stack. The software stack does an analysis, says, oh, looks like these two packets belong to the same flow. I can take the data from the second one, pin it to the first one, get rid of that SKB, right? And we'll continue to do that for the rest of those other end packets, creating effectively, if, if everything's gone right, the packet on the RX side looks exactly like the packet that was sent on the TX side. A large payload with the headers on top of that, and that's what goes through the film lookups, the socket lookups, and all the other networking infrastructure hooks. LRO comes along and says, software can't analyze everything. It's gonna to be too slow. Hardware needs to do this. Hardware needs to identify that all of these packets go together in the same flow. And so then the driver creates one SKB and appends all that data onto that packet so that it takes care of the burden of the overhead in terms of uh, what's got to be done to create the large SKB that goes up the software stack. Okay. So with a good LRO algorithm, you can see. Or a good, yeah, hardware LRO algorithm. You can see how it would compare as you vary the MTU and what you're going to get for your data rates. So adjusting just the MTU only is the bottom line. Using software GRO is the middle line, but it's the hardware LRO that gets you the big speeds. Okay. And that dip at 6800, and we'll come back to. This shows the packet rates on the wire. Really what it's, what it's getting at is you know, it's kind of flat when you start looking at that MTU, which really gets into, you're, you're, you're bounded by how many packets per second the software stack can manage. So one thing I haven't heard people discuss before is this correlation between MTU and TSO. You have to have a good TSO efficiency. And if you make a bad choice in your MTU, your TSO packet size is not what it could be. And so your software has to do more work for the same load, okay? So this is what I'm getting at here. And a prime example is to pick one more towards the 8,000 range. 8,200 MTU in, in an IPv4 52 byte uh, overhead, um, it puts eight segments into a TSO packet. 8,300 can only put seven segments. An 8300 MTU is 12% less efficient in that TSO packet size. So you're making software do more work just because you picked the wrong MTU. All right, so the bottom line that I'm trying to get at with all of this is reducing that software packet rate means you have to have a solid LRO algorithm. One that can handle out of order frames, one that can handle multi-flow on the same set of queues, 
Um, and, and again, one, one that's going to do the work for you so that software doesn't have to do any kind of analysis to see how things can go together to reduce the, the burden on the software stack. Really now. All right, continuing to peel back these layers. We've, we've talked about no mem copy, memory management aspects of it, and reducing the software stack. The next one gets into keeping the pipeline primed. You don't want hardware to ever be waiting, hey, I got nothing to do, right? So that means more data to send. Well, the BSD socket APIs, that's the receive message, send message calls, okay? So when you do a send message by default, iperf 3 defaults to 64 kilobytes. That means every time you call send message, it's only gonna kick 64 kilobytes down to the curve. It's not very efficient. You're doing a lot of system calls to send data. On the other end, you can keep jacking that parameter up and the socket buffers on the kernel side to hold those references, but you do kind of reach this plateau where you're not going to get uh, any more benefit out of shoving more things in in a single call. But really, the key point of this is the overhead of using sockets to get data to and from the hardware needs to be improved. There's a lot of overhead there that we got to we got to get, get past. Well, I mentioned that dip at 6,800. Well, when I'm doing all these different tests and closing in all these parameters, I, I, I honed in on 64 meg for a send message call. That's, a, that's a, every time I did a send message, it was sending down 64 meg in a, in a single write. The socket buffers were set to 128 meg, right? And kernel, the, the Linux kernel doubles that size internally to 256. Um, so that was an interesting little tidbit that at 6,800, there's this huge drop, like, and it was consistent every single time to 6,800 MTU capped out around 250 gig. But if I change those parameters to 32 and 64, suddenly that little well shifted somewhere else. Okay. So I think what this is really speaking to, it's, it's, I was going to go down this path of digging into exactly the details of what's going on, the, that's grains of sand and how the kernel's managing that socket buffer. And that's when the hardware died at the end of June. And I never had time to come back to this. But effectively what I'm getting at with this entire socket buffer syscall thing is we have to have a better system to manage the data path that does not rely on system calls. IOU ring is an example of this. It has user kernel queues where you can set up the what you want to send and a completion queue to reap it without having to do a system call. So it's in the right direction, but it too is not sufficient. It doesn't handle hardware queues, for example. And it also doesn't do RX. So the next thing I hit, should thank Eric for this, because I kind of got a little blinded by all these different variables that I'm going through. And I kept seeing SKB release data pop up in Perth code. And I'm like, wow, this is weird. Like, we just have way too much overhead going on with these SKVs, all the different fragments trying to represent the pages that are coming down. And Eric made a comment in one of the, the net dev discussions about huge pages. And I went, oh, yes, of course, right? Using huge pages, an SKV only has two, mostly, and then occasionally when you're flipping from one huge page to the next, you'll get a third fragment per SKV. That makes a huge difference in your performance. But backing out a little bit, what this is generically saying is how the buffers from an application perspective are presented in an SKB as it makes its way down the stack or makes its way up the stack to the application, we've got to improve that. Got scripts, got hardware. Just control algorithm, which is an easy sweep, just change a parameter. What this shows, cubic, DC, DC, TCP, you know, like all of them kind of behaved okay. BBR, on the other hand, and I know there's BBR v2 is on GitHub, so it's in the works. Um, I didn't want to deal with downloading out of tree software and compiling it and running those kind of tests. But BBR, which was really confusing, and we could not figure out why, it was flat, pretty much flat and around, uh, I think it was 150 gig. Hardware considerations. Um, speed is important. You're, you're processing packets coming in at an insane rate. So certainly a faster CPU is going to help out. Avoiding CPU cycles is the best. One of the things we learned in these tests is that task placement had a huge impact on our performance. 
For example, our original CPUs were Epic based and 7502, I think was the processor. They only had two CPUs. We disabled um, SMT, two cores per L3 cache. You could literally watch the performance of iPro3 tank as that process moved farther away from the K-thread processing end, right? So the key there is that task, if you're trying to run really fast, you need to think about task placement. In this case, what we found was the IRQ and the software IRQ processing on say CPU zero, and the task pinned to CPU one was the best performance. Then we got these Ryzen boxes and the Zen 3, and the Zen 3 architecture was a lot better. Um, that L3 cache spread out over more CPUs, and it was a little less sensitive. So the task pinning was more like, ah, be somewhere in one of these seven, these eight rather, as opposed to, you gotta be exactly on this one. Memory speed was another one. Um, during a pandemic, you take what you can find, right? Um, 2400 speed memory was not going to cut it. We had to go to 3200 to really push the Epic servers. Luckily, all our Ryzen servers had 3200 speed. But that hardware failure we had in the June reinforced another lesson that you know we weren't necessarily thinking about as, as well as we should. And the change that the guy made to the hardware, when he had the Ryzen box open, he noticed a couple of the, the slots weren't populated. So we put in DIMMs in all the slots. And that was the difference. It was the only other change you made to the hardware that took us from a 670, 680 up to 782 hardware speeds, right? So the key there is when it comes to AMD servers, at least you got to populate all your memory slots to get your, your, your fastest speed. On the ring size, you, you can see this with Mellanox today, the Connect X5, Connect X6, 4096, you're dropping back into the hardware. There's just too much time, the packet's coming in too fast compared to the time it takes for the software to wake up and start processing it, that you, you basically have to set that ring size to 8192. So that one worked best for us as well in this FPGA. 16K didn't really make a difference at all. So I said this VCU 1525, it has two, two CMAX on it, right? So we can do 200 gig connections. Server has 16 cores, so hey, let's set up and let's run multiple streams. So this gets into the scaling out part of what we want to make sure is going to be our work, as well as that scaling up. So being able to run multiple applications at line rate, for example, or the way they're placed on the server. Um, so anyway, it, it, of course, the theory worked out that you can run multiple things in isolation, of course. Kernel regressions. So we stuck on the 5.13 kernel for a reason. 5.15, and I'm fairly certain I know which patches it was, caused a regression. It got worse in 5.17. So our performance with 5.17 was 25% less than we could do with 5.13. And then we got a tiny bit of an improvement in 5.19. I think I know which patches did it in 5.17, but the key there is, you know, it is that death by a thousand paper cuts thing where Somebody's coming in, putting in patches, which are an optimization, which may not be an optimization for other use cases. So um, something we got to work through. Miscellaneous tidbits, you learn all kinds of things doing performance tests. Um, one of those is Ubuntu loves this config option where if you go to the global allocator, it wants to zero out that page for you. I think kills performance, CPU intensive. Um, you got to disable that config option if you're trying to run high speeds. SMIs, if an SMI comes in on you, you got packet rates coming in in the nanoseconds. One SMI, you just, you're, you're not processing your queues, you're done, right? You're not going to keep up. The other part of this was the absolute random things happening on a server. Someone would keep starting up LLDPD to do some validation on the networking configurations. One packet socket killed performance. And you spend all this time trying to figure out which one's got it, which one's doing it, who's doing it, right? So this really gets into this notion of generically, it's applications running high performance can be killed by something random. And so this notion of a packet socket cloning everything is an example of that. So in summary, we do think Linux TCP stack can be the basis for high scale uh, computing. But there are some bottlenecks around the socket API that need to be addressed. 
we got to have a scheme where hardware replaces the packet payload data directly in the application buffers. Clearly, by Kuba's recent blog post, Jonathan Lim and ZCTAP, you know, lots of people are thinking about ways to do this. Um, we got to have a better memory and buffer management scheme. This idea of dealing with pages, with ref counting, with DMA setups and stuff, all that overhead has to be amortized in a better way. LRO is absolutely essential. Software analyzing every packet that comes through is never going to work. You got to have a good solid LRO scheme. And then the, uh, the system calls for send message, receive message completions, that's got to go as well. And so again, the IOU ring notion of user kernel queues is a part of that solution, but it is still more to it. And then the last one is a uh, simple representation of that application memory in the SKB as it traverses the networking stack. Okay. And then the isolation gives you that scale out and up capability. All right. So that was a whole list of things that we would like to see changed. We have a talk coming up in NetDev, which gets into one set of solutions on how to make this work with Linux. Thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for the uh, fantastic you know, sharing. Uh, I have uh, basically two questions, two questions. First question is I'm a bit confused you know, when you try to tackle this processor as LP cache issue, right? Because the exact generation AMD processors really have the DIO server conditions, right? And also their match system uh, comparators similar to the generation. I'm not having a hard time following you. Say that last sentence. Okay, good. What I mean is, the generation AMD lacks PDIO similar features, right? Compared with them. And also, for the next generation AMD, their MASH system, right? MASH system for the memory. Okay. okay. Also, they lack the read compared with them. Yeah. So I, I'm really confused why you use that new AMD processor to tackle LP cache performance issues here. Right. I'm very interested to see uh, the result when you run with isolate. I'm kind of very interested to you know why you should the first question. Uh, the second one is well, let's let's go to the first question. Right? Okay. Um, so I didn't pick the, the CPUs. So the you know I joined the company only a few months in, but there was already this push to use a new graphic that was the conference. Um, and it was a notion that you know, a lot of the Like the Googles and the Facebooks and such are all essentially focusing on Epic as a way to do their standardized deployment and their network. Right? Yes, so that was one of the reasons why. But we very quickly started sort of tripping over a lot of these major issues. And some people in the company knew that you know the Zen 2 architecture was a, was the culprit. And so Zen 3 helped in the rise of 9. And Zen 3 was the architecture showed how AMD is moving in a better direction with the way we manage. Um, the, the, the caches as well as the memory. Um, so, uh, you know, I was really sharing the CPU effects of that more from the other things that I tripped over, um, just making people aware of it. I'm not trying to be critical of AMD or any buttons, it's just these are just things that we hit and then passing on. Yeah, but I'm not sure if the PDI address there can yeah. solve the problem in the sense that. But well, one thing we have to remember also is because we were not manning the data, PDIO would not have affected. So we're not actually doing the DMA payloads. We simply have pages that we stick on the SKB to represent the data. So the DDI kind of sweeping wouldn't have been an exception. It's basically anything because if, if all the traffic is cold, the DDI would inject, inject all the traffic to the LP cache directly. Suddenly you have to put that. Okay. But the second question is about so the MPU song. The 7000 looks like the magic number, 7000. And not what is for you, all your charts. What's the case that we can sign to 7,000? Performance has a dramatic withdrawal. Is there any reason for that? You know, I didn't analyze much of the higher end use because uh, I think it's, I think most people would agree. Uh, uh, people doing data centers are not really jacking the MTU up into the 7,000, 8,000 range. It's going to be more like a 4,000 and under or the 90, 9100, 9000 jumbo points. Um, inter intervening intervening uh, data points there, which is kind of some nice things. Um, 
you know, things like the 6800 for the dose, the 7200, I think, would have moved to the smaller buffer sizes. Um, again, I, I was going to go after what exactly Linux is doing and the way that it manages the right queue, uh, the socket queue, and how much data is constantly there and being drained, and why suddenly there would not be able to push faster. Um, it just seemed like an odd blip to me. But when the server died, it, it affected everything. Right? I lost one and a half what I wanted to do for a day and a half months. Anyone else? Thanks. Uh, where to go talk? I see you doing a lot of testing on different technique sides. So, do you have a bit of a, a recommended size overall? So the bulk of my testing, I kind of honed in on the 3300, 3400 MCU size, and that was in part because of Mellanox. Um, I think my brain kind of got biased with some other testing that I was doing. If you watch Mellanox 5's Connectx with the driver, Mellanox 5 driver handles uh, Connectx 5 and 6. When you go above, I think it's 3560, uh, it goes into non-linear mode, right? That's when when you look at the way the page is allocated, the shared info, and the header part of that, and then the XDP um, reservations, if you try to do XDP on a low server 3560, I think it is, it's a little bit So for that point, initially, I stopped going over 3500. The 3500 didn't perform as well as 3400. The 33 and 34 kind of went back and forth on which one was better. So and when you look back at that, that chart. I don't know if this is still up here. You can see that really huge, oops, there we go. Uh, really big ramp up at the beginning, which is where you're getting the majority of your benefit. And so it peaks out around 4,000, right? And then after that, running at higher MCU is only going to affect all of the boxes in the market, right? Because they have to allocate memory to land packets, so regardless of what size the six worldwide packet comes in, you allocate a 9,000 or a 16K, which you have to go power to, you're wasting a lot of memory now, right? So that's why I think the more realistic sizes are kind of in that 33, 3 to 4,000. Right? And I think Google's gone to 4,000 because of the RX zero copy Thank you. And then, uh, any insight why DDR are going so badly? I'm quite surprised that the graphic developer. Uh, <laughs> um, I didn't analyze DVR at all. We did dig through the code a little bit, had some conversations um, with some of the developers. Um, I think really the focus would be on DVR V2 to see how that performs. But, you know, I had downloaded that code at one point with file and kernel, had to jump through some hoops to get it compiled and working, and then it was just using the 5, 13, 15, 17. So I guess really kind of waiting for BBRB2 to make its way into the kernel. And then, you know, we've got these boxes that can run the sweeps in the time the company gets put in. How do you do? Follow up, pulse line, yeah. Okay. Uh, you show it the in a couple of the direction, depending on the current direction. Yes. So, I think it'd be better if you have a conversation with someone. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Jacob.